The year 1910 saw the crowned heads of Europe flock to London for the funeral of Britain's immensely popular King Edward VII. In France, Marie Curie was continuing the research to discover radium and polonium, which would soon win her a Nobel Prize. While former US President Teddy Roosevelt was making discoveries of another kind during an expedition to Africa. And the exploration ship Terra Nova sailed from London carrying Captain Robert Falcon Scott on his ill-fated attempt to reach the South Pole. Barely had the year ended when the streets of London echoed to the almost unprecedented sound of gunfire. Police struggled to hold back curious onlookers as they and a platoon of elite guardsmen attempted to root out a group of heavily armed anarchists which had taken refuge in Sydney Street in London's East End. After several hours of confused firing, the building caught fire and the anarchists finally stopped shooting. When firemen had extinguished the blaze, two bodies were found in the charred ruins. It was the final act in a drama which had begun about a month earlier. On the evening of Friday, the 16th of December, 1910, a police constable patrolling in the city of London was called to investigate strange noises coming from exchange buildings, a small alleyway near Houndsditch. The Vile family, who lived in number 120, Houndsditch, next door to a jeweler's shop owned by a Mr. Harris, had reported noises, which sounded like brickwork being knocked down. Harris was known to keep his stock in a safe at the back of the shop. The constable went round to exchange buildings and started knocking on the doors of houses which backed onto those in Houndsditch. As he got down to those which were level with the jeweler's shop, he found that numbers 9 and 10 appeared to be empty, but the door of number 11 was briefly opened by a furtive-looking man. Suspicious, the constable went for reinforcements. Among them, Constable Choate and Sergeants Bentley, Tucker and Bryant. Then, leaving Constable Choate to guard the end of the alleyway, Bentley and Bryant knocked on the door of number 11, Exchange Buildings. A man opened the door, but as the policeman stepped in, another man appeared and started firing. Sergeant Bentley was hit in the neck and shoulders. He fell back against Bryant, who was hit in the arm and staggered back into the street. The two men, both now firing wildly, dashed out over the fallen policeman. Sergeant Tucker was also hit and collapsed. The gunmen, now followed by two other men and a woman, dashed up to the end of exchange buildings where Constable Choate grappled with them. A confused struggle followed in which he was shot in the back, but in the melee, the gunman also shot one of his own companions. Dragging the wounded man, the gang was seen by one eyewitness crossing Houndsditch. They then disappeared into the narrow streets of London's East End. Behind, they left Sergeants Bentley and Tucker and Constable Choate dead. The police discovered that both numbers 9 and 11 exchange buildings had recently been rented for storage, but the people concerned had given false addresses. Number 10, which was directly behind the jewelers, was already empty, and the gang had been able to get through its yard unseen. The gang had been in the throes of knocking through from the privy in the yard of number nine into the back of the jeweler's shop. 
the nation was appalled by this sudden outburst of lethal violence on its streets. The London press had little doubt about the identity of these murderers of three unarmed policemen. From the ruthlessness with which they had been prepared to use their firearms, it was concluded that they were almost certainly foreign. For London, at the beginning of the 20th century, was a magnet for immigrants from many countries. Capital of the world's first industrial power, it was one of the largest and richest cities in the world. During the latter part of the reign of Queen Victoria, the British Empire had grown to rule a quarter of the world's surface. Under her successor, King Edward VII, the country seemed at a pinnacle of power and success. In contrast, despite the glittering facade which it could present, the Russia of the Tsars was still a backward and autocratic country. As the 20th century dawned, democracy was unknown, and the power of Tsar Nicholas II depended on control of a massive army and extensive secret police force. The divine right of the Tsars to rule absolutely was widely accepted by a largely illiterate population, and persecution of minorities such as Jews was widespread. The rule of the Tsars was also supported by an extensive and widely resented aristocratic class. Russia was still largely an agricultural country, and although serfdom had been abolished in 1861, the majority of its people still toiled on the land in conditions little above slavery. There was a rapidly growing industrial sector, but conditions there for the average worker were also primitive. Unrest and strikes were ruthlessly broken up, and many people sought to escape by emigration. Pogroms against the Jews also caused many to flee. But Russia's immediate neighbors offered little escape. The German Empire of Kaiser Wilhelm II was another absolute state, which did little to encourage non-Germans to settle. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was no more welcoming to mass emigration from the East. Republican France, with its traditions of liberty and democracy, did attract the more middle-class refugees and became a hotbed of radical activity. But it lacked the industries to offer a refuge for the masses. For many emigrants, the only solution was to set off across the Atlantic to the New World. The rapid industrialization of the United States during the last decades of the 19th century could absorb millions of desperate people looking for a better life. Nearer to home was London. The East End, with its myriads of small workshops and teeming slums, was the area to which many refugees came to settle in large, almost self-contained communities. These retained their own language and customs and caused considerable resentment among local inhabitants. Among the immigrants came political refugees, men who had led the fight against the autocracy of the Tsars and their secret police. Most of these were loosely termed anarchists, regardless of their politics. Anarchism as a creed had grown up amid the poverty and degradation of the rapid industrialization of the 19th century. Its followers looked forward to the eventual abolition of the state and private property, and the establishment of a sort of collective ownership. And there were those militants who saw it as essential that the state should be attacked by force to bring down the existing capitalist system.
In 1901, the assassination of President McKinley of the United States by an immigrant Pole and self-professed anarchist brought home to many in the West the potential threat to their system. Mixed up with the true anarchists were nationalists from the Baltic states who were determined to rid their countries of Tsarist rule. Following the Bloody Sunday Massacre in St. Petersburg in 1905, there were risings against Russian domination. A fresh wave of dedicated revolutionaries fled abroad from the brutal military repression which followed. London, with its huge population and relaxed policing, provided the ideal cover for such men. But despite the belief of many anarchists that forcible expropriation of capitalist wealth was totally justifiable, the capital had surprisingly few outrages. A French anarchist, Martial Baudin, had blown himself up in 1894 while trying to bomb the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. But it was not for another 15 years in the suburb of Tottenham that a fresh outrage occurred which brought anarchism into the news again. Two Latvian emigres attempted a wages snatch. Foiled, they hijacked a tram and were chased for several miles, shooting indiscriminately at their pursuers. A policeman and a 10-year-old boy were killed before the gunmen were cornered and shot themselves. Their willingness to shoot ruthlessly and then to turn their guns on themselves gave the London police pause for thought as they started to look for the Houndsditch killers. Their first problem was to find where in the vastness of London their quarry had gone to ground. And almost immediately, they had a break. For the morning after the exchange building shooting, a doctor rang the police to say that he had been called to nearby 59 Grove Street to treat a man with a severe gunshot wound. Detective Inspector Frederick Wensley told the doctor to go ahead. The police would not move in until he had left. But when the doctor reached the house, he found the man lying dead. The police were called and they arrested a young woman who was found in the next door bedroom. She was Sarah Trashonsky, a Polish Jew who worked as a seamstress for a Russian family named Milstein. The dead man was identified as George Gardstein handsome young Latvian who had fled from the Tsarist police and was wanted for armed robbery in Germany. In his pocket was the membership card of Lisma, a Latvian anarchist group founded by 20-year-old Jakob Vogel and a friend who was known only by the name Biftex. The police had already been watching Vogel, who was also wanted for bank robberies in Europe. They were convinced that Lisma had connections with the Tottenham shootings and had been watching its leaders for some time. Among the other young political refugees who had been put under surveillance was Gardstein's roommate, Charles Svars. Gardstein soon became Lisma's leader when Vogel decided to go underground because the police were becoming too interested in him. It was their lodgings at Grove Street which came to be the focus for a group which included Tsvar's cousin, Jakob Peters, who was wanted back in Russia for firearms offences, Yorka Dubov, John Rosen, Karl Hoffman, Peter Pyatkov, always known as Peter the Painter, and Gardstein's girlfriend, Nina Vasilyeva. The police also now discovered that Svars was the lover of Luba Milstein, with whom Sarah Trashonsky worked. On the assumption that the dead Gardstein had been behind the Houndsditch shootings, the police now began to pick up members of Lisma. An older member, Osip Fedorov, was arrested in his lodgings the next day. Then Luba Milstein was turned in by her family on the Monday, and two days later, Jakob Peters was found. 
the witness who had seen the Houndsditch gang identified him and Yorka Duboff, who was arrested the same day, as the men who had been helping the wounded Gardstein. A post-mortem picture of Gardstein was released. This was recognized by his landlord, and bomb-making equipment and ammunition were found in his room. On the 1st of January, 1911, the police had another break, when Charles Farr's former landlord tipped them off that he and another member of the gang, known only as Josef, had been hiding nearby since the shooting in a girlfriend's room on the second floor of number 100 Sydney Street. Two hundred policemen, some armed with shotguns, moved into the area during the late evening of the 3rd of January, 1911. Under cover of a bitterly cold and windy night, they evacuated the families living in the surrounding houses. Most were immigrants who understood little English. Finally, they managed to get this elderly couple from the ground floor of number 100 but it was decided that the stairs up to the second floor were too narrow to rush. So as dawn broke, detectives watched from the surrounding rooftops as Detective Inspector Wensley attempted to make contact with the anarchists. Their response was to start shooting at anything that moved. The police replied with their shotguns, but these were no match for the Mauser automatic pistols that the anarchists were using. By now, excited crowds had gathered in the surrounding streets, and the police were having severe difficulty keeping control. It soon became apparent that police firepower was totally inadequate, and a request was sent asking for troops to be dispatched from the Tower of London. This was approved by the 36-year-old Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, who then hurried to Sydney Street to see the action. Twenty Scots Guardsmen armed with Lee Enfield rifles arrived and took up positions at each end of the street and in surrounding houses. The anarchists were now keeping up a steady fire, changing position frequently within the house. The soldiers and police returned fire whenever they saw a target. Winston Churchill arrived at midday and stationed himself on the corner of Hawkins Street, about a hundred yards from the house. Some 400 shots had been fired when at about one o'clock, a wisp of smoke was seen coming from number 100. Soon the fire had taken a good hold. Churchill told firemen to stay clear until the roof and first floor collapsed. Then the police checked to make sure that no one had broken through to the adjoining buildings. Finally, the firemen were allowed to start tackling the blaze. As they worked, part of a wall collapsed, killing one fireman and injuring four others. Two badly charred bodies were found in the ruins. Josef had been shot in the head and Svars had been killed by the smoke. It was reckoned that the fire had been started by a bullet going through a gas pipe. When Sergeant Bryant had recovered sufficiently, he identified George Gardstein's body as that of the man who had fired on him and Bentley. The Home Secretary was among those called to give evidence at the inquest into the deaths of the three policemen. George Gardstein was named as their murderer and they were buried with full honors.
the police concluded that only Peter the Painter, whose dramatic nickname had aroused widespread interest, remained of the ringleaders. Despite an intensive search and the offer of a substantial reward, he was never found. Instead, the police added to the five they already had in custody by rounding up Nina Vasilyeva, John Rosen, and Karl Hoffman. Vasilyeva was also identified as one of the gang seen by the eyewitness crossing Houndstitch after the shootings. Then, at the committal proceedings in London's Guildhall, came the business of trying to work out what to charge the suspects with. Soon, much of the police case against their eight suspects began to fall apart. Sarah Trashonsky had a nervous breakdown and was sent to a mental hospital. Then Luba Milstein had to be released for lack of evidence that she had been involved in her lover's activities. Then it was realized that there was no real evidence against Hoffman and Fedorov, so they were also released. In the end, only Peters and Dubov were charged with murder and Vasilyeva with harboring a felon. All three were charged with conspiracy to break and enter, as was Rosen. Their trial began at the Old Bailey on the 1st of May, before Mr. Justice William Grantham. He stated at the outset that he could see no grounds for a murder charge, since all the blame for killing the policeman had already been attributed to Guardstein. The judge intervened again to say that the identification of Peters and Duboff as the men seen by a single witness helping the wounded Guardstein could not stand uncorroborated. Without this, the police had no case, and they were found not guilty and released. The conspiracy charge against Rosen was also soon dropped, but there was firmer evidence against Nina Vasilyeva, since her fingerprints had been found at 11 exchange buildings. But her counsel successfully portrayed her as a foolish young girl led astray by her infatuation for the handsome George Gardstein. Although found guilty of conspiracy, she was released on appeal. Only many years later did more facts about what really happened at exchange buildings emerge. Gardstein had indeed led the gang which attempted the robbery and was the man who had opened the door to the police. But it was almost certainly Jakob Peters who had come in firing and did most of the killing. This was borne out by his subsequent career. For Peters returned to Russia during the revolution. He became a member of the Military Revolutionary Council in St. Petersburg, and during the Civil War, he rose to be a trusted lieutenant of Lenin. Ironically, the man who had fled the Tsar's secret police then became deputy chairman of its successor, the dreaded Cheka. Peters signed countless death warrants, and often carried out summary executions himself. But shortly before the Second World War, he too was executed in one of Stalin's purges. The killing of three policemen in exchange buildings and a subsequent siege at Sydney Street shook pre-First World War Britain with its assumptions of a law-abiding and tolerant society to the core. For many, the siege became an omen of the great outburst of violence, which would soon overwhelm Europe. 